If you look in this wavelength, this is just plain old ultraviolet, 1600 angstroms, you're seeing the foot points. This is the cooler part, 100,000 Kelvin part, that is down here. 100,000 Kelvin is there. Uh, it's radiating a lot. This is where all the losses are coming from. But uh, it, it doesn't show you any of the loops. It just shows you the feet. Of the loops. I am going to skip over the details of that nasty part of the transition region. Uh, that, is, that is very difficult to understand. And here's just sort of a summary that, that the heating is, in fact, magnetic. So whatever is doing, adding this energy, we don't really fully understand it. But here's a plot of the amount of magnetic flux, Gauss centimeters squared, Maxwell's, in a bunch of different things, and the amount of energy lost at least to X, various bands of x-rays. And What we see here are these are small little magnetic features on the sun called x-ray bright points. These are bits of even smaller clumps of magnetic field. These are the active regions, those big coronal loops. This is the whole sun. And these are a bunch of active stars. And what's truly impressive is more magnetic field means more radiation. Whatever's adding energy to the corona basically scales with the magnetic field. And this is over 10 orders of magnitude. This is very, very robust result where uh, we, we know empirically that that heat source is scaling with the magnetic field. Now, I talked a little earlier about the fact that this magnetic field is being generated by a dynamo, and it varies in, for various reasons. Yeah, question. It's a little bit different from one. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, one. I think it's 1.19. You're pretty pretty close. Yeah. Uh, it's actually, I think it's greater than one, if I remember correctly. Um, we could talk about that. But that's still the coronal heating problem is one of the great unsolved problems in our field, and and understanding this slope would would be tantamount to it understanding the answer to that. So when you ask, are there any theories? Yes, there's lots of them. <laughs> is there any, is there any uh, accepted theory? Not yet. Um, that's, that's your job. Maybe during the break, you can solve the coronal heating problem. No. Uh, OK, so, so this magnetic field, which is so important in generating the corona, varies over the solar cycle. And so here is a plot of the number of this is actually not the sunspot number, but it behaves just like it. Uh, and then here is an image of the corona of, of the type we just saw. And this is what the corona looks like in 1996, when, as we saw, the sun was mostly dipolar, and it doesn't have a lot of sunspots. And 97, 98, 99, all the way up to 2001, solar maximum, the peak of cycle 23, and then back there. And you can see. The number of these active regions, the places where the corona is particularly bright, is certainly going up. And then if we look at the x-ray flux of the sun, and this is the way we often measure it using this weather satellite called GOES, uh, does an all sun integration of the uh, x-rays from the 1 to 8 angstrom band. And here is, sorry, the, these axes are, are illegible. This is 1996. This is solar minimum right there. And over the course of, there's 2001, the x-ray luminosity of the sun as a whole goes up by a factor of 50. So now we see exactly how this all works. The sun has this dynamo that's generating magnetic field. And there's a period where it becomes less dipolar and full of these little closed coronal loops which hold on to very high density plasma and make the x-ray luminosity of the sun quite high. And then it becomes more dipolar, and the magnetic field lines are much longer, uh, maybe don't even hold on to their heat. And as we see, we get far fewer x-rays. So the x-ray luminosity of the sun, and this is why I, I alluded to the fact that other stars, uh, we can see lots and lots of uh, that gives us an idea of how much magnetic field there is. And it's for this reason. Um, 
let's see. I don't, I don't want to talk about too much about flares. Uh, but one of, the, one of the consequences for the rest of the heliophysics system uh, is uh, the solar x-rays uh, are coming from the corona. Now here is a plot of how much light we're getting from the sun, what the irradiance is as a function of wavelength. This is done by uh, people here. This is in volume three. Um, and it's done in nanometers. So uh, our x-rays sort of, this is uh, 100, uh, 100 angstroms, 1,000 angstroms. Here's the visible light. Uh, this blue is the spectrum. And this red dashed is a black body spectrum, 5770 Kelvin. So the sun, you'll often say, is a black body. Well, no, it's a black body out to this wavelength, sort of around 2,000, 3,000 angstroms, the visible part of the sun. In case that's a black body. But a black body would basically have no radiation in the X-rays that you see. And in fact, the sun has appreciable amounts. Uh, and you can see here, the green is how much Why? Because that corona, which is maintained by the magnetic field, is varying with the solar cycle. Variability is the minimum, the maximum divided by the minimum divided, maximum minus the minimum divided by the minimum. This would be this spectrum. This is more than 100 percent, so basically factors uh, factors 10 or more uh, variation. So this portion of the spectrum from the sun varies tremendously because it's from the corona, and the corona depends on the magnetic field of the sun, which is varying. Another plot from the Hughes spacecraft showing uh, how complicated this kind of spectrum is. It's not a black body spectrum. Uh, finally, I should I should point out. Iron ionization states that produce EUV in this. Uh, the hot plasma also produces X rays. Oddly enough, the same kind of hot ionized plasma will produce microwaves. Uh, I didn't show you that part of the spectrum, but here is an image made in 17 gigahertz at Nobayama, uh, and a very similar image of the UV, 193, you can see the emission from all of the same structures. So microwaves are a very popular way of measuring the brightness of the corona, right? This is, this is one of the sort of more visually arresting methods. But this is equally valuable. And here's a plot of not the sunspot number, but the brightness of the sun in 10.7 10.7, uh, 2.8 uh, 2 gigahertz. This is a proxy for how much of a corona the sun has. All right, so that's the closed magnetic field corona. Um, I want to jump to the other portion of the corona, which is the places where it doesn't appear so bright. So the density is lower. Does that mean there's no material there? No, there is some material. But these magnetic field lines, rather than closing from one foot point down to another, these are magnetic field lines that go off into space. And we're going to talk more about these, because this is the origin of the solar wind. And the important part about that is if I imagine the same picture, but now instead of having two foot points, I have one foot point. And then I have magnetic field lines that go out. Now I have heat in and I have radiation out, just like before. But I have one more loss mechanism. I can actually drive a flow along these field lines that will also carry energy. So I have two loss mechanisms. I have the radiation, and then I have the outflow. So in other words, there's a, an advective loss of energy. And we have 
uh, basically kinetic energy carried by that flow, bulk kinetic energy, uh, that, is, that is flowing out and therefore lost. And we have W, which is the enthalpy of the flow. That is the internal energy of the flow, thermodynamically anyway. That is also being carried by the flow outward. Um, the little bit of thermodynamics, the enthalpy of the flow is basically related to the adiabatic index gamma, about 5 thirds for these plasmas. So gamma over gamma minus one over nine rho to the gamma minus one over nine, function of density. Enthalpy of an ideal gas. And because the energy, because the flow is, the fluid is going out, it's carrying this internal energy with it. Uh, and that is, in fact, that is, in these cases, much more significant than the radiation. So it's, it's not only a second way to lose energy, but it turns out in these low density regions, it's even a more effective way to lose energy. So the these regions have heating. Maybe it's, all, it's about the same level of heating as the, the closed field lines. Uh, but they have a, a, a better way of losing their energy. So they are, well, we'll, see, we'll see what that, that ultimately means. This is what's known as a coronal hole. So the way to understand this mathematically, the energy loss rate as I said, I'm going to throw away the uh, I'm going to throw away the idea of, of radiation being lost, and I'm going to gather together the cross-sectional area of this outflow times the mass flux rho v. Okay? So that's just the number of grams per second leaving this funnel, this tube, times the energy per gram, which is one half v squared. This is the kinetic energy. There's the internal energy, the enthalpy. And there's the gravitational potential energy. This is the amount of energy being lost. And it has to balance the amount of energy coming in. If the heat in is Q, then this heat out must be Q. The question is, what does that do? Well, this mass loss is fixed as well. So actually, what we have is this big constant here must be constant. Must yeah, this big expression here must be constant. This is Bernoulli's law, right? You all remember Bernoulli's law when, when the uh, pressure goes up, the flow slows down. When the pressure goes down, the flow speeds up. Right? It's just this, this uh, thing that's often shown to you to explain why airplanes fly. Uh, this is Bernoulli's law. And so in this flow, we must conserve this quantity. Okay? It's also the gravitational potential energy. So what does that actually tell us about the, the flow and the density? Well, you can start to work through. It turns out the easiest way to do this is to take a limit where instead of gamma being 5 thirds, we're going to let gamma go to 1, which is to say, let's just, to make the math easier, imagine that this heat is being carried by a fluid at constant temperature. And if it's a constant temperature, the enthalpy is just the logarithm of the density. So now I have the following thing that has to be constant. The velocity squared, the logarithm of the velocity, and then this function of position, which is the logarithm of the area and the gravitational potential energy. This must all be a constant. This is basically a rewriting of this same term. And what's really interesting is this constant consists of a function of position and a function of velocity. Right? The function of velocity is 1 half v squared minus c squared log v plus the constant of position. And if I look at this constant of this uh, function of velocity, it actually has a minimum at the sound speed. Right? So if V gets very small, then this logarithm gets very big, and it blows up. If V gets very big, then this V squared gets very big, and it blows up. The point where the two balance is right at the sound speed. So I have I have two different branches where I can have a given value of this constant. The other thing to notice is this other thing. If I basically say I'm in a cone, so the area is increasing with distance, then I have a nice function of position. And it allows me to 
write a function of radius, which is a log minus 1 over the radius. So it's another function I can plot. And you basically see something that if r gets very small, then this 1 over r dominates, and I go to minus infinity. And if r gets very big, then the logarithm vanishes, and I go to minus infinity. And there's a maximum for this function here. And that is at a particular radius. And the radius is given in terms of the escape velocity at the surface and the speed of sound. So there's just a particular place where this function is going to be a maximum. And the key is that the sum of these two functions must be constant. So what I've done is plotted a, a function, which is the sum of these two, con these two functions. And you can, this is kind of a funky contour plot. But I'll talk you through it. It's really just the, the plot of if you go up at a certain, say, a certain radius, say here, then this is just that function of velocity we talked about. It goes to infinity here. It has a, a minimum here. And it goes to infinity again here. So this bottom curve is basically where the function is very big, maybe infinity. The top place is where it's very big, maybe infinity. And this is where, and it's right along velocity being the sound speed, that's where the function is its minimum if I go up and down. That's this point here. And then if I go across, same thing. This is basically minus infinity. Over here is minus infinity. So I have this plus, minus, plus, minus, and I have a saddle point right in between. This is that magic radius right there. So what I said is the flow, as it leaves the sun and has to carry its heat with it, has to follow one of these curves that has constant, uh, one of these curves, because that's a constant value, value of the Bernoulli's constant. And what that means, well, let's, let's take a few examples. This flow here that goes from the sun, r equals 0, out, out. This is always below the speed of sound, so this is subsonic. What it's doing here is as it goes up, it's subsonic flow, and it's actually encountering higher gravitational potential. And this actually has the, the same effect as if I were taking my subsonic flow and putting it through a nozzle. We all know what happens if you take flow and send it through a nozzle, right? You speed up or slow down? Indeed, that's what happens. It gets to the narrowest point, right? Which is really the place where this thing here becomes a maximum. And then it's as if the nozzle were expanding again and my flow slows down. It speeds up and it slows down. What about these flows here? These are actually approaching the nozzle, and they're slowing down. Fluids do that? If they get close to the nozzle, do they slow down? Yeah. If they're supersonic, they do. Supersonic flows do exactly the opposite of subsonics. So where the flow is supersonic up here, it is going to slow down as it approaches the nozzle, and then speed up as it goes away from the nozzle. And the, the thing is, if you want to get on one of these subsonic branches, then when you slow back down again, you're going to get to very low speed. And you're going to have almost the same, you're going to have basically the same density and therefore the same pressure you had in here. So this is all well and good, as long as interstellar space contains exactly the same pressure as the corona. It doesn't. lines, right? This would be like what, what happens if you have a, a bottle of compressed gas and you open the nozzle. Well, as long as it's inside a room that has the same pressure, then the gas will just go out and it will stay subsonic the whole way. You open a bottle of compressed gas in our atmosphere, there is not a pressure balance between the inside and the outside. And it must go supersonic. 
And there's only one place it can go supersonic, and that is at this saddle point. That is where the solar wind occurs. Okay? It's just the exact same thing that does happen in these nozzles. You always have to go through on this transonic curve. If you were actually trying to stay on the transonic curve, you would have to have the same enthalpy here as you have there. Otherwise, you're on this transonic branch. And flow, well, it's subsonic to start with, and so it sees the decreasing area and it speeds up. Then it gets to the narrow throat, becomes supersonic, and it sees an expanding nozzle, and it speeds up. And it behaves exactly the opposite. So therefore, it speeds up and then speeds up, and so you go from subsonic to supersonic flow. You must flow a long distance. So this is the solar wind. It's carrying the heat away because it's a much more effective way of getting rid of that heat than trying to radiate it. And in order to do this, it has to flow from subsonic close to the sun to supersonic away from the sun. And you can actually figure out then what is the property of the solar wind based on what the properties are at that throat. Because that's what fixes which contour you're on. Okay, so that, that particular radius tells you that this is what the mass flux must be. Okay, So, basically to summarize, our mass loss rate, the amount of, of if mass we're losing through this flow is specified entirely by Q. F of X is fixed by the value of this contour right here. So that's sort of fixed. And Q is, again, the heating rate. Sorry, I changed it from H to Q. But, uh, what happens is the more energy I dump into, the, into this corona, the more mass flows out. Density is fixed by that as well. We always know that whatever the density is at the bottom has got to be higher, lower than the density was in the corona, in the closed field corona, sorry. How do I know that this density, because this seems like an entirely different problem I've solved, how do I know that the density down here is going to be lower than the values I would have gotten if I solved for the equilibrium with the radiative losses. Be a lower density. If I don't. What? No, no. But we're talking about the fact that I threw away radiative losses from this problem. There were radiative losses. So this has basically got two ways to lose energy. One of them is related to its density. I know that if its density were the same as in the closed region, it would be losing density just fast enough to balance the heating in. But yet it's also losing energy to outflow. So it's losing energy in two different ways it must be losing less energy to the radiation so that it has some energy. So compared to something that only has one channel, one hole in the bucket, the water coming out of that one hole is going to be more than, yeah, sorry. But you know these coronal holes are always going to be darker in, in emission than closed corona. So that's a picture like this. We have these little loops, these are the closed field lines, and therefore their density is always higher than these open field lines. And there's no mystery now about that. The heat going in, we don't have to say too much about what that is. I know that if this comparable heat was going in here, it's losing that through radiation and, and convective loss and uh, advection flow. So 
if it's going to balance, I better be losing less through radiation so I can lose some through the flow. And at these closed loops, they need the higher density because the only loss mechanism they have is radiation. They need to boost their density so they can lose that through radiation. Um, let's take a five minute break here. Done. Uh, yeah, question. Yes, there's also conduction in this case. However, the, the version I showed you was with the temperature being completely uniform, which there would be no conductive losses. So you're right, there would be also conduction if the temperature have a gradient here. Of course, there's flow constantly moving. You have, you have more ways to lose heat in this case. In this case is going to be lower density. No. Actually, very often the coronal holes are at the poles. We'll talk about, I'm going to start talking about the geometry of these. Yeah, the, the next question here, I'll, I'll leave you to know where we're going. Why are some field lines open and other field lines closed? Um, back to our spherical harmonics. I'd say this is a, you know, it's actually particularly close to the equator. So I didn't I should have told you that oops, I thought I turned this off. Yeah, I'm not I know that that actually
apologize in advance. Exactly so. Or three o'clock. Guys, please write it down and let's talk about it after our lab or maybe even during our lab. No, after our lab over cocktails uh, because I, I won't be able to stick around. Now, I left you with, so we had this idea that, yeah, the, the, the story about how heat is lost Solve Laplace's equation, del squared chi is equal to zero, inside a sphere. But now I'm going to make it a little bit more complicated and say, all right, I know that at the solar surface, r equals r zero, I've got the magnetic field that was generated by the dynamo. Region inside the sun where this magnetic field is being generated by all the mechanisms we talked about earlier today. Then above that, there's such low density that the current is effectively zero. And then we have this outer region. And when this flow starts to go supersonic and starts to really pick up speed, it's actually going to be have enough ram pressure to cause the magnetic field to deflect. So the very simplest picture, and we, and we use this all the time, is to think, wow, it's going to deflect it so much that the field at this surface, magnetic field will be perfectly radial to go radially outward with the flow that was driven supersonic. So we have basically a, a concentric sphere problem. We have a condition on the inside set by the dynamo and a condition on the outside that is called the source surface. And we'll see why that is. But what I'm going to have to do then is say B theta and B phi are zero. That tells me that this potential is zero at the source surface. Here are the conditions. I'm solving Laplace's 
first equation with the Dirichlet condition, chi is equal to zero at the source surface, and a Neumann condition set by whatever I think the magnetic field is at the surface of the sun. There's two surfaces. The source surface is this outer radius. And the solution I'm looking for, I was using just this decaying one before. All the spherical harmonics decay off as an inverse power of radius that is L plus 1. In order to match the Dirichlet condition, I also need the growing power, r to the L. And in fact, I need their difference so that when r is equal to rs, zero. Right? So this satisfies it regardless of what these coefficients are. And these coefficients are chosen to match the magnetic field at the surface of the sun. So that's a really quick, oops, I'm being told I forgot to turn my microphone on. And I need to put it up higher. OK, thank you. Yeah. All right. So um, not to dwell too much on all these, on all these uh, mathematical details, but suffice it to say that this inner boundary condition, which is a Neumann boundary condition, comes from observations. So I can find all of these spherical harmonic coefficients from observations, and then I can build up this whole solution between these two surfaces. And here's an idea of how we make those observations. These are those same magnetic field measurements I've been showing you. It shows you what the, what the magnetic field is along the line of sight. It's positive or negative at the surface. That's the place that I can measure the Zeeman splitting. Um, and so I measure it over a sequence of days. And then I say, well, I sort of know on this day, I know the magnetic field pretty well right along the center. And I place that there. And then I wait a few days. Actually, time is going backwards here. So I wait a few days, and I get the magnetic field here. I get the magnetic field here. I build up a map of the magnetic field. However, I must be <laughs> assuming that this magnetic field is not varying very rapidly, because it takes me 27 days to build up a map. And I'm measuring only a bit at a time as I unroll this. Okay, But once I have that, I have my Neumann conditions. And I can apply them. Okay, So there's the, there's the full solution here. And then I decompose it. And what I will then get is a magnetic field that looks like this. I will have. Places where the magnetic field has closed down underneath the source surface. So it just goes from positive over to negative. And then I will have other places where the magnetic field has opened up. Okay, And in my unwrapped version, this is actually, here's where the, well, here's the places where the magnetic field is open. These are the coronal holes. This is the part of the surface where the magnetic field is open. This is the part of the surface where the magnetic field is closed. And then between them are the parts of the surface with positive magnetic field and negative magnetic field that are closed down. So these are the closed field coronas. These are the coronal holes in this simple picture. Okay. So does everyone see how this kind of picture works? And this just comes from those spherical harmonics. So this is known as a potential, because I'm using a, a scalar potential source surface because I'm, I'm imposing that kind of boundary. Potential field source surface model. So how many people have heard, you've heard mention of potential field source surface models? Kind of a workhorse in this industry. And I think, how many of our labs are going to use PFSS models? Nick? Oh, uh... None? <laughs> wow, OK. Sorry. I thought, I thought, I thought we, were, we, we did, OK. Good. Oh. OK. All right. But these are, these are uh, very much a, a sort of mainstay of heliophysics. It's a simple way of figuring out where the solar magnetic field should be open and closed, at least in this simple, simplified model. Here's an actual version using that same uh, model I showed. These show the bounding fields, the ones that just aren't quite closed and aren't quite open. They basically end at a place where b is equal to 0 on the source surface. 
and they form this really cool set of, of helmet streamers. The red portion of the solar surface are the northern coronal holes, and the green portion are the southern coronal holes. Okay, So th this is our, our way, at least uh, simply, and if I move that back to here's what it looks like looking down on one of these maps. So every field line, every blue field line goes right from the boundary of an open to closed up to a place here where BR is equal to zero. That's why it doesn't know if it's open or closed. It comes to a place where the magnetic field is zero and it stops. Magnetic field lines do stop. Some well-meaning but misinformed person may have told you in your past that magnetic field lines have no beginnings or ends. When there's a magnetic zero, when magnetic field is zero, magnetic field lines end. And that's what they do here. Just those, just those that hit that one place, though. You can see that R equals 2.5. Very common place to assume your source surface is. It's not <laughs> given by any law of nature. It's just a, a, an empirical fat, an empirical fit. We've sort of placed them there. Um, Field lines. This is the portion of the solar wind, of the solar surface that is open. So then we have that loss mechanism through flow. The flow will expand outward. It will go supersonic uh, and flow ever outward. Here are the portions of the coronal hole coming from the south. Here's a place where, just through these spherical harmonics that we've developed, we see that the coronal hole actually extends up almost to the equator. So we get these extensions, and that just comes about because in the original map, there was some strong sources there, which meant there were a lot of high L spherical harmonics, which distorted the coronal magnetic field and made it do that. Thing than that. This was what I showed you before when I was telling you, oh, the sun's magnetic field does look like a dipole, well that's only out at far away from the surface. And this is the map of the magnetic field strength at that surface. And it's considerably weaker. It's all negative down here in the south. And then there's the place where B, BR is equal to zero. Phi and B theta are zero by construction. So B is exactly equal to zero along that whole line. And here's B coming straight out, positive. Okay. So this, is, this is the way that we understand how the magnetic field of the sun segregates into closed and open regions, and where we get the coronal holes. So there's the source surface. This is what it looks like at the source surface. This is what it looks like at the solar surface down here. It's quite a bit more complicated. Question then, we've got this simple picture of closed and open field lines. Now, now I'm going to start to talk about what happens to the magnetic field and to the solar wind when it goes out beyond 2.5 solar radii. And here's where, at least in the simplified picture, but this is a very common one that we use, we have to admit that we've, we've <laughs> We've made an approximation here that the magnetic forces are totally dominant. Okay? So if there were any current, it would create a force, and that force would be so strong that nothing around could oppose it. And then when you cross this orange line, the situation reverses completely. And you assume now the fluid flow is dominant and the magnetic forces are negligible. So the flow goes outward just like it was launched and it just carries the magnetic field straight with it. Uh, it's, a, it's a vastly simplified picture, but it's the one that a lot of us work with all the time. So the solar wind sort of is that portion of the solution where the flow is just going radially outward. And it has been accelerated, or will be accelerated. It may not be quite supersonic here, but it shortly will be. Uh, and now there's no forces on it. <laughs> So what happens to 
particle or a flow or a fluid element when it's got no forces on it. It goes in a straight line at constant speed. Right? Sort of back to freshman physics. So all of the all of the solar wind in this simplified picture is essentially flow going straight outward, radially outward. And it carries the magnetic field with it. So does that mean the magnetic field is all straight? No, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, it's very interesting because what actually happens to the magnetic field, the flow is going radially outward. And it has got the magnetic field. It carries the magnetic field along with it. But the sun is rotating. And so the pieces of field line it, it is springing with it are actually being swept. The field line itself is being swept to the side. And so you end up with this spiral structure known as the Parker spiral. It's often likened to the pattern you get when you see a, a rotating lawn sprinkler. And the water droplets form these nice spiral patterns. And of course, that's because the water's going out along a spiral path, right? No. Right? What did we say about <laughs> no forces acting on a body? It's, they're all going in complete straight lines. They just form that pattern because they're being launched from different places. And that's exactly what happens with the magnetic field lines. The flow, and here they've actually given you the formula for the, magnetic, for the velocity, is just VR r hat. And VR is basically fixed can't be changed because there's no forces acting on it. So it's radially outward at constant speed. The magnetic field has this shape. And here we're seeing some closed field lines, like I said in my cartoon, some open field lines. There are outward field lines that go positive and outward field lines that go negative, places where that BR vanished at the source surface. This is a place where things change from outward to inward. This is known as the heliospheric current sheet. It's what separates all the magnetic field in the heliosphere that goes outward away from the sun from all of the magnetic field that goes inward to the magnetic sun, to, this, to the open field lines. And as you remember from the, the cartoon, those could be at the North Pole and the South Pole. And the heliospheric current sheet would then go across the equator. Here they sort of distorted it so that they could draw it on a two-dimensional picture. but. <laughs> Well, let's, let's take a, a picture. We do work with this model, don't we? The Enlil model, Nick? Yes. OK. Uh, this is a similar kind of thing. It's a little more sophisticated, but the magnetic field is being dragged outward in these spirals. Um, this, this model is used by NASA to figure out which magnetic field lines are going through which spacecraft and which planets. So they've got all of the planets in our solar system. Well, Earth out to, Venus, out to Mars, uh, at least. Uh, and then they trace these spiral magnetic field lines back in to the sun. Um, they've also plotted over here the density, the plasma density uh, in the colors. So you see there are regions where the, the wind is carrying higher density field than lower density field. But that gives you a picture of the power of this kind of of simplified picture. Um, and as well as they uh, also want to know where Spitzer is and Stereo A and Kepler, all in this picture. So, um, but we, we talked about the fact that the, the dipole moment of the sun, which is what dominates most of the time, is actually not always just pointed northwest, north south. Sorry. So, uh, at, at times, it can be very distorted or very, uh, very tilted. Um, and sometimes around the, the solar minimum, it does get more or less a, uh, a north-south orientation. That means this value of BR equals 0, this is the heliospheric current sheet, is falling very close to the equator. The sun is rotating around that equator. When it is tilted like this, right? We have this radially outward magnetic field, a radially outward wind carrying magnetic field with a boundary between the, posit the outward and inward field. And that boundary is being spun around. You get this classic ballerina skirt picture 
This is what happens when you drag that tilted surface outward with a radially outward magnetic uh, solar wind. Right? It forms this rippled pattern. This is what happens to that boundary during these periods of, of tilted dipole, dipolar magnetic field. OK, uh, so this is, the, this is the view of the magnetic field at the source surface. This is the view at one solar radius. This source surface is what determines what magnetic field is being moved radially outward to fill our heliosphere. Okay. Um, we sort of talk, touched on this, and I showed you this picture here, this movie where the solar source surface is being distorted. We get very tilted magnetic field, very quadrupolar magnetic field, and it settles back down to a reversed field. And we also talked about this. And here, we are, I am emphasizing the fact that the Z component of the dipole moment during this solar minimum around 1985, the magnetic field dipole axis was downward, was to the south. And then in this next cycle, this is the minimum, the solar maximum is here. The minimum, it's upward, and then the next one, it's downward. So this is the dipole moment of the sun flipping over. And one might wonder what impact that has. And as far as heliophysics is concerned, one of the consequences is what happens to cosmic rays, which are encountering this radially outward flowing wind carrying a spiral magnetic field. Um, and so this is a, a, a topic that Dr. Lee, who's back there, will be talking about cosmic rays. Uh, I am going to start with the idea that these cosmic rays originate far, far away. Right? They're actually generated in uh, shocks at supernova remnants somewhere in our galaxy. Uh, shocks are great places to accelerate particles. I think we'll hear about that. Uh, those are great shocks to accelerate particles at. And so it basically fills our galaxy with all these high energy particles that are, are moving through space. And here is a plot of the flux of those particles, just protons and helium nuclei, uh, as a function of energy, and to very high energies. This is, for protons, this is 100 MeV. This is a gigavolt. Right? So these are very, very high energy particles. Uh, and they're coming from all around our galaxy. And they have to, if they're going to get to Earth, they have to make their way through this solar wind. And the solar wind has a lot of mass going out. But interestingly enough, we may hear more about this, if you're a gigavolt proton, you're probably not going to know anything about other particles. You have too much energy. Your collision cross-section is way too small. As far as you know, the sun is surrounded by vacuum. Well, with one exception. It's surrounded by magnetic field. You can't ignore that. No matter how much energy you have, the Lorentz force is going to make you curve. You'll have a big curve, but the solar system is a big place. So as far as these particles are concerned, all they see is a spiral magnetic field, but the magnetic field has a pattern that's moving outward. Okay, And what? So we have no collisions, but we do have deflection by the solar wind magnetic field. And that magnetic field is, out, is evected outward. There are also fluctuations in it, about which I expect we'll hear more. That basically causes some diffusion. Uh, and in the end, there's also particle drifts. And this is a, a topic of uh, some complexity. I don't want to get into all of this. But suffice it to say, this is, this is the formula for how the gyrating center of these particles is going to move in time. And it depends entirely on the direction of the magnetic field and the gradient of the magnetic field. So this is a drift velocity for these gyrating particles. If you haven't seen 
particle drifts before, then you'll just have to take my word for it. But we're just going to do some simple vector calculus. Here we have a cutaway view of the sun, the heliosphere. So there's the sun. We have radially outward flowing solar wind. And we have, at this point, let's say a dipole that's oriented to the north. So that means I have magnetic field pointing upwards. And then with the solar rotation, I'm going to get magnetic field that drapes backwards. And in the northern hemisphere, it's going to come out of the page. And in the southern hemisphere, it's going to come into the page. In the northern hemisphere, it's going to be going outward, radially outward. In the southern hemisphere, it's going to be going inward. So far, so good. This is all for this particular orientation. Um, now, yeah. Uh, I don't know that this is drawn with a scale. This is this is the better part of the solar system. Um, this is this is supposed to be the sun is just basically that little dot there. So this is the whole solar system. This is actually the heliospheric current sheet being warped up. You can see just like I said, formed into this ballerina skirt. So the D is not exactly north south. It's got some tilt to it, um, and it has that form. Um, OK, but the magnetic field strength, certainly as you go away from the sun, the magnetic field strength drops off. So we have a gradient in B that's going inward, and we have a gradient of B that's going inward. So now let me figure out what's happening to the cosmic rays. And the cosmic rays are basically going to be going in the B cross grad B direction. Well, it's only this part of the B that's going to matter, so I take into the page, cross that way. And if I do the right hand rule correctly, I get the fact that the cosmic rays are going to be drifting towards the heliospheric current sheet in the southern hemisphere. If I look up here, I have B out of the page, cross grad B. B, I have to do this myself. B out of the page, cross grad B. The cosmic rays are also flowing into the heliospheric current sheet. So all the cosmic rays that are coming from everywhere are going to mostly be going in towards the heliospheric current sheet, and then something will happen to them. OK, did everyone follow that? Okay. So the other, the other thing that's going to happen, well, let's, let's just leave it at that. OK. So. So there, uh, OK. So I think one other thing I want to point out, you look at this form of it here. Don't worry about what all these prefactors are. This is the curl of something. So whatever this flow velocity is, it must be divergence free. So whatever's happening to these cosmic rays, they're not piling up anywhere. They're just flowing in towards the heliospheric current sheet. Uh, that actually means they must be going out along the heliospheric current sheet. So cosmic rays are doing that as well. So they're drifting out along the current. So in this orientation, the cosmic rays are coming in along, in along everything, and then out along the heliospheric current sheet. This is the case when BZ is, sorry, DZ is pointed upward. And when I reverse this, I don't think I have a picture of that, essentially I'm going to change B, but not grad B. So all of these flows are going to reverse. And I'm going to get flow in along the heliospheric current sheet and out along the poles. So actually, the way the cosmic rays enter our solar system is different when the dipole is, is pointed northward than when it's pointed southward. And in fact, when you don't have any dipole, right? so, so say at solar maximum, now I don't have any drift at all. Right? Because essentially then B would be 0 and grad B would be 0. It would be this very complicated magnetic field that really wouldn't have any large scale structure to it. And then there's no drift. So the cosmic rays aren't going to have any path into the solar system. Okay, So. When we look at the 
number of cosmic rays above a given energy, we see that at solar minimum, we get a large number. Solar max, we get a smaller number. Solar minimum, we get a large number. And the other interesting thing is if you look at, this is solar cycle 23, 22, 21. If you look at the even versus the odds, they are different. So when, B, when DZ is positive, I get this kind of shape. This is when the field uh, cosmic rays are coming in along the poles. And then here's where they're coming in along the heliospheric current sheet. I don't know that I can explain why they have the shape they do, but it's not surprising when you hear that they have different paths into the solar system that the, the way that they behave over the solar minimum is going to be different. So you have this distinct even-odd pattern. You can definitely see here that the solar cycle is a 22-year cycle. The other interesting thing is the number of cosmic rays reaching into the heliosphere is higher during solar minimum. So this is a different result than you may have thought if you said, I'm going to get on a spacecraft going to Mars, and I don't want to be irradiated, or I want to be as radiated as little as possible. It turns out cosmic rays are a pretty significant source of radiation. So this is telling me I should go at solar maximum. I will have fewer cosmic rays, because they don't have that nice organized magnetic field to work their way into the solar system and hit me and irradiate me. So counter to what you may have thought, our safest time for space journeys is during solar maximum. You have the sun's, cosmic, or sun's energetic particles to worry about, but you don't have the, the uh, cosmic rays to worry about. OK, uh, and I'll just. Uh, and here, uh, I'll have to sort of wrap it up without getting into a lot of the other details. But since we're talking about long scale modulations in this summer school, this is sort of the kind of, of thing I want to think about. How the cosmic rays are modulated by the solar wind, how the solar wind is modulated by the sun's magnetic field. And here's a picture of a mission called Ulysses that went over the north and south poles of the sun and measured the solar wind speed. Now, this picture has been reproduced a lot. Uh, it's pretty hard to read the axes. This is at a given latitude, right? a given angle here. The, the curve here shows you the speed of the solar wind. That's 1,000 kilometers per second. That's 500 kilometers per second. So this is 800 kilometers per second. This is in solar minimum, right? so when it's outbound sort of solar minimum, uh, 800 kilometers per second dropping down to somewhere below 400 kilometers per second when you're in the heliospheric current sheet. Slow solar wind, fast solar wind. When you get to solar maximum, and it's very complicated, the solar wind speed is very complicated. It's all mixed up. right? There's no longer this organizing dipole to tell you where the heliospheric current sheet should be. And so you get fast and slow solar wind in all sorts of places. And then later, when you go through at the next solar minimum, you have this fast solar wind in the north and south hemispheres, and then the slower solar wind along the heliospheric current sheet. Uh, I think I'm going to have to wrap it up now. Probably have time for one or two questions. And the last couple of slides, which have to do with uh, interactions of different kinds of solar that's not, it's more uh, having to do with disturbances. Yeah. <laughs> I think it didn't actually go right over the pole. Marty, do you? Several degrees off, OK. Yeah. I would imagine the amount of time it spent at those super high latitudes is very short. So probably the averaging they had to do to create this data didn't get them that far down. OK, good. Good question. <laughs> That's not true.
But I, I think there are others. Long, a lot of discussions you can have about how one decides 